Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the AT&T second quarter 2018 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star and then zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to our host, Michael Viola, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Lori, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second quarter conference call. Uh, as Lori said, I'm Mike Viola, Head of Investor Relations here at AT&T. This is our first call, first earnings call, uh, after we closed our acquisition of uh, Time Warner, and we're broadcasting this call from uh, Warner Media headquarters in New York. As we told you earlier, we're going to use this call not only to discuss the quarter, but we're also going to provide more details on our strategy. And to do that, uh, we've brought together the CEO, CFO, and four business leaders of our business units. Uh, today's agenda is going to begin with John Stevens, who will cover AT&T and Time Warner's second quarter financial results, as well as update our outlook and guidance. Randall will provide a strategic perspective of the business, and then each of the business unit leaders will take and talk, will, will talk about their second quarter results and give a perspective of their businesses going forward. After that, the entire team will be available to participate in the Q&A session. I'd like to mention you know, one save the date item. We plan to host a sell side meeting on the evening of November 29th, and followed by a buy side meeting that next morning on the 30th. Both will be here in New York, and all the folks on this call will join us for those meetings. So please mark your calendars and more details to come. Now, before I turn the call over to, uh, to John, uh, I need to call your attention to our safe harbor statement. It says that some of the comments today will be forward-looking, and as such, they're subject to risks, uncertainties, results may differ materially, and additional information is available on the Investor Relations website. I'll, need, I'll also need to remind you that we're in the quiet period for the FCC CAP 2 auction, so we can't address any questions about that today. Um, as always, our earnings materials are available on the Investor Relations page of the at and website. That includes the news release, 8K, investor briefing, other associated schedules, and available on our website are materials on Warner Media's full second quarter. It includes trending schedules and other important documents. And so now I'd like to turn the call over to at and Chief Financial Officer, John Stevens. Thanks, Mike, and hello, everyone, and thanks for being on the call today. Let me begin with our financial summary, which is on slide five. I think most of you know, the FASB has been very, very busy this past year implementing a number of accounting standards, five of which have direct impact on AT&T. Those include standards that deal with revenue recognition, pension reporting, impacts on cash flow reporting. <clears throat> These changes impact our income statements and cash flow at the same time, the company made a policy decision to record universal service fees net um, uh, as an offset to our regulatory fees. Uh, we're working hard to help you understand these changes. So in addition to the GAAP financial information, we're providing comparable historical results to help you better understand the impact on financials from revenue recognition and the policy decisions, as well as Time Warner's second quarter results on a historical basis. We'll be referring to these historical results in our comparisons during the call. Now, let's start with EPS. We continue to show strong adjusted EPS growth, up more than 15% for both the quarter and year to date. Tax reform continues to have a positive impact on EPS, as does the adoption of revenue recognition. We also had about two cents of help from the 16 days we owned Time Warner, which we have renamed Warner Media. The Warner Media earnings contribution was slightly more than what you might expect for such a short period. But as you know, financial results can be uneven, and we saw that in the second quarter. Consolidated revenue came in at $39 billion, down slightly from a year ago, but that includes about $900 million of pressure from how we are now accounting for USF fees on a net basis. When you look on a comparable basis, revenues were up slightly. Thanks mostly due to the two weeks of Time Warner revenue, but also helped by gains in wireless and AdWorks. 
We continue to, to use our tax reform savings to invest in and grow our customer base. As John Donovan will discuss, these investments help drive postpaid phone growth and significant year-over-year -year improvement in prepaid phone net ads. Continued growth in consumer broadband customers, even in a seasonally challenging quarter, and solid subscriber growth in total video customers. Adjusted consolidated operating margins in the quarter were up year-over-year -year on a reported basis, but down on a com comparable one. Solid smartphone sales drove some of the pressure to margins, but the biggest factor continues to be customer transition to over-the-top video. Let's now look at free cash flow. It was a strong $5.1 billion for the quarter, up substantially both year-over-year year and sequentially. Year-to-date, our cash from operations and free cash flow is up about $1.5 billion, which makes us very comfortable with our free cash flow guidance for the full year. Our cash flows also reflect the timing differences between spending for first debt and the reimbursements we receive from the organization. These usually trail spending by several months. Year to date, that comes to more than $100 million of free cash flow pressure. Capital spending for the quarter was $5.1 billion, or $5.4 billion before the $300 million of first debt reimbursements we did receive in the quarter. Let's now cover financial results from operations beginning on slide six. AT&T's domestic mobility operations are divided between the business solutions and consumer wireless segments. For comparison purposes, we're providing supplemental information for our total U.S. wireless operations. A wireless business turned in very good results. Year-over-year -year service revenue turned positive. Margins remain strong, and we had phone growth in both postpaid and prepaid. Total revenues were up year over year, thanks to gains in both service and equipment revenues. Also, service revenues were up almost 2% sequentially. Strong sales and BYOD supported that growth. Our upgrade rate was down year over year, but our equipment revenues were up reflecting customers' purchasing habits and their choice of more expensive devices. But even with these strong sales, margins were very good, with service margins coming in over 50% on a comparable basis. Looking ahead, we expect positive service revenue growth for the full year on a comparable basis. Turning to our entertainment group, we continue to see the impact of the video transition in our revenues and our margins. This will take a while to work through, and we expect it to continue the rest of the year. But we are seeing some sequential stability in both revenues and margins. We're making changes to drive revenues and effectively manage the transition. We're getting through some promotional pricing that impacted revenues in the past, and we now have new features on our next generation platform that will drive additional revenue opportunities, such as cloud DDR, a more robust uh, VOD experience with new pay-per-view pay options and an additional stream capability. John Donovan is going to walk you through those plans in a few minutes. Also helping is AdWorks, which continues to grow at a double-digit rate and is now an annualized revenue stream of over $1.8 billion. Moving to our business solutions group, revenues were down as gains in wireless and strategic business services helped offset declines in legacy services. Business wireless and strong growth, up more than 4%. This is driven by both equipment and service revenues. Wireline revenues were down more than 4% year over year. We still expect tax reform to produce a lift in communication spend, but we just haven't seen it yet. Wireline EBITDA margins were up slightly on a comparable basis. Cost efficiencies continue to offset pressure from legacy products and our investments in FirstNet. In our international business, solid customer performance helped offset currency pressures. Revenues were stable year over year, while margins were pressured by World Cup expenses as well as foreign exchange. 
Now let's look at Time Warner's second quarter financials on slide seven. Time Warner had strong growth at all operating divisions on a comparable basis. This includes strong subscription revenue growth of both Turner and HBO. Turner also showed solid advertising revenue growth of 3%. Adjusted operating income was $1.8 billion, driven by increases at Warner and HBO. Now for some housekeeping items. With recent ASB accounting rules, the Time Warner merger and purchase price accounting rules, there's going to be a lot of new information included in our results. We're going to do our best to make that easy for you to understand. First, we'll file pro formas with the SEC in August. Second, we have posted the full second quarter results for Time Warner on our investor relations website. This includes the Time Warner historical results, trending schedules, all the information that you're accustomed to seeing. Finally, as you're updating your models, keep in mind the following. Results will continue to be reported at the divisional level, but there are certain things that will be eliminated in the corporate and other segment, including about $3 billion of annual intercompany content revenues and purchase accounting impacts on customer base and deferred production costs. We're very excited to have Time Warner as part of the AT&T family and the Warner Media as part of the AT&T family, and John Stanky's going to provide more insights and highlights in a few minutes. Now let's look at our 2018 outlook with Time Warner included. We're raising adjusted earnings per share growth to the upper end of the $3.50 range with Warner Media included. Year to date, we're already seeing 15% growth. The impact of tax reform, improving wireless service and advertising revenues, as well as the addition of Time Warner supports strong adjusted EPS growth, even with the additional shares issued as part of the deal. Looking at free cash flow, our free cash flow guidance at the beginning of the year was standalone. We expect most of the benefit of the Time Warner free cash flow for the last half of the year about $2 billion, will be absorbed by integration and deal costs, including severance costs, retention incentives, legal fees, bankers' costs, and interest expense prior to close. When you consider those items and slightly lower cash capital spending, we're raising expected free cash flow to the upper end of the $21 billion range with dividend coverage in the low 60% range and that's even with the additional shares and dividend responsibility from the merger with Time Warner. Now that we are halfway through the year, we also have a better view of CapEx. Capital investment is expected to be in the $25 billion range, but that'll be $22 billion of CapEx on our cash flow statements after you net out our first net reimbursements and some of the vendor financing opportunities that our team has pursued. A primary focus for us this year and the next few years is deleveraging the business. We have a strong business that generates a ton of cash and EBITDA, and we are very confident in the deleveraging targets that we have given you. Let me recap them now. Net debt to EBITDA is projected to be in the 2.9 times range by the end of this year and the 2.5 range by the end of next year. To reach that target, we expect even that growth. We use excess cash to pay down debt. And as always, we'll continue to look for ways to monetize non-strategic assets. You've seen that recently with the data center deal and our pending sale of broadcast 600 spectrum. We expect to return to historic debt levels to the 1.8 times range by the end of 2022. That's the financial summary. Now I'll turn it over to Randall. Randall? Hey, thanks, John. And uh, it was an exciting quarter. After 600 days of reviews and litigation, we did finally complete the acquisition of Time Warner. And then just a few days later, we announced our agreement to acquire AppNexus. And if you're not familiar with AppNexus, it's one of the top ad technology companies around. And as John mentioned, we've renamed Time Warner to Warner Media, so we'll be referring to that as Warner Media from here forward. And as John Stankton will cover later, they had a really strong second quarter. We couldn't be pleased, more pleased with how the condition Jeff left the company with us. 
We've now assembled the key elements of a modern media company, and it all begins with owning a wide array of premium content because we are absolutely convinced that there is nothing that drives customer engagement like high-quality premium content. And whether it's Netflix, Amazon, Google, Disney, or Comcast, everybody is now pursuing the same thing. How do you deliver great media and entertainment experiences to our customers? And I think the recent valuations of media companies is reinforcing this point. But we couldn't be any happier with the range and quality of brands that we now own. For live programming, it doesn't get any better than CNN for news. And for sports, we have the NBA, March Madness, NFL Sunday Ticket, Major League Baseball, and the PGA. And for original premium subscription content, there is nobody better than HBO, our cable networks in Turner are among the best, and they're performing well. And for content creation, our production studio at Warner Brothers is the gold standard, and they possess one of the deepest IP libraries around. And when you talk about digital content, we now own the CNN.com digital brands, and these are the most visited websites in the world. And add Bleacher Report and the Otter Media Properties, and we have what we think are a terrific set of digital assets. And bottom line, we absolutely love this portfolio. But just owning great content is no longer sufficient. The modern media company must develop extensive direct-to-consumer relationships. And we think pure wholesale business models for media companies will be really tough to sustain over time. And when you look across our wireless pay TV and our broadband businesses, we now have more than 170 million direct-to-consumer relationships. And these relationships are critical as we begin developing new media experiences for all kinds of different audiences. And then the 170 million relationships provides invaluable insights for new advertising models. And that's exactly what's behind our investment in ad technology. Today we use our data insights and we deliver ads on direct TV. And when we do this, our advertising yields improve by three to five X. And as you're gonna hear from Brian Lesser shortly, that business grew 16% in the second quarter. Now Turner has an ad inventory that's three times the size of our direct TV inventory. And as we apply this same data to that inventory, we expect a significant lift. And AppNexus, that acquisition is all about improving our capabilities and reducing our time to market here. So you take these three elements, premium content, 170 million direct-to-consumer relationships, and great ad technology, and then you combine those with our high-speed networks, and we think all of this is a game changer. Bringing these four elements together has changed the way we think about our customer value proposition. We spend our time now thinking about how to combine these elements to create unique customer experiences. How do we combine the best content wherever you are and make it easy to find and consume? What are the new products that combine content and connectivity? How do we create personalized content experiences, including personalized ads that you find useful? So hopefully you begin to see why we're so excited about putting all of these capabilities together. Now, we knew the Warner Media deal was not going to be like any other we had done. It's a vertical bolt-on with a media business. And a media business obviously has very distinct culture, talent, and business models. So last fall, in anticipation of the merger, we reorganized the company into four separate businesses. And you can see those on the next slide. What we've done is push the core staff functions and the decision-making out into the business units, and we left behind a very small staff at corporate. And this is all about increasing speed and efficiency at each of these businesses. But at the same time, we need to foster cross-platform coordination to generate the synergies that John Stanky will be touching on next. Today, we're going to change the earnings call around a little bit, as John Stevens pointed out. We're going to give you a chance to hear from each of these business unit leaders. And then when they finish, we're going to stay on the, the phone and answer any questions that you have. And then John Stanky is going to lead us off. John is the head of Warner Media. And then you're going to next hear from John Donovan, who heads up AT&T Communications. And then Brian Lesser. He's the head of our advertising and analytics business. And he's going to walk you through his plans. And then finally, you'll hear from Lori Lee, who heads up our Latin American businesses. 
and she's going to take you through an update on really the great market momentum that we're experiencing in Mexico and also talk about the latest on our Latin American TV business. So with that, I'm now going to hand it over to John Stanky. John? Thanks, Randall. Good afternoon to all of you. I've been on the job now a little bit more than a month, but during the time I've had the opportunity to meet with various leadership teams of Warner Media, and I don't think it's a surprise to any of you, what I found is what I believe to be an unmatched dedication to producing unique and engaging content across film, television, sports, and journalism. I'm looking forward to my continued work with this team, and I uh, think we have great opportunities in front of us to further harness the exceptional content and capabilities of Warner Media. John gave you the financial highlights of Warner Media's second quarter, but let me dig in deeper, and you'll see those results on slide 13. Time Warner's last quarter as a standalone company had strong revenue gains at Turner, HBO, and Warner Brothers. Turner saw solid growth with gains in both subscription and advertising revenues. Subscription revenues benefited from higher domestic rates and growth at Turner's international networks. Subscriber counts have been stable thanks to growth in virtual MVPDs with three of the top five ad-supported cable networks among adults 18 to 49 in prime time. The Turner Networks are proving popular in every video bundle as evidenced by their inclusion in every major live OTT provider. Turner Sports Properties helped drive strong advertising revenue growth in the second quarter, led by the NBA on TNT broadcasts. HBO also delivered solid revenue growth in the quarter. Subscriber revenues were up 13% due to strong U.S. subscriber growth and gains in international markets. Higher television revenues helped drive strong revenue growth at Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers TV looks to build on that success with more than 75 TV series in production for the 2018-19 season. That is the studio's largest number of TV series in production at one time ever. Here's another good indicator of what kind of quarter and year Warner Media has had. Warner Media companies, HBO, Turner, Warner Brothers, received 166 Emmy nominations, which include 22 nominations for HBO's Game of Thrones alone, followed by 21 nominations for Westworld, which is produced for HBO by Warner Brothers, a real twofer for us. These nominations speak to the caliber of the talent and dedication to quality across the company. My congratulations go to the entire Warner Media team for their exceptional creative achievements. During the roughly six weeks since we closed the deal on June 14th, we've been working strategically to integrate the two companies. That includes apply, applying the data analytics from AT&T's distribution to the Turner ad inventory. As you know, this is one of the benefits of combining our two businesses. You've seen the success of the AdWorks group using targeted advertising for DirecTV and Ubers. Now we have three times the ad inventory to work with. We believe we can get meaningful CPM improvement in what Turner sees today. Brian Lesser will explain in a few minutes we expect this is only the beginning of our success. We've also moved quickly to position Warner Media content on AT&T distribution platforms. We intend to push the Warner Media consumer brands even further across all platforms. We've been busy with the basic blocking and tackling that comes with any merger, integrating corporate and staff functions, getting our infrastructure systems to work together, and aligning corporate management. We'll look to achieve synergies with our advertising spend and other, and other procurement areas by getting better rates from vendors and suppliers. For example, AT&T was not the primary telecom supplier for Time Warner. Now we begin that transition for Warner Media. These types of efforts will help us deliver on the $2.5 billion in merger synergies we promised. While all of this has been going on, We've been very deliberate in shaping some long-term initiatives that we think will add even greater value. We've developed thoughtful plans on where we want to go next with Warner Media 
and have several goals that we want to accomplish. First, we want to increase our investment in premium content. HBO's name is synonymous with quality entertainment. The creative talent at HBO is the best in the industry. My goal is to give the HBO team the resources to greenlight additional projects already in the development funnel. We want to invest more in original content while still retaining the high quality and unique brand position of HBO. This will further strengthen the HBO brand, enhance the customer experience, improve churn, and drive more engagement with some of our most valued customers. Second, we plan to further develop and nurture our direct-to-consumer distribution, including HBO Now. That will include enhancing existing platforms as well as delivering premium content to the more than 170 million direct-to-consumer relationships across AT&T's video, mobile, and broadband platforms in the United States and Latin America. We also plan to add even greater value to these relationships by focusing, aggregating, and incorporating more Warner Media intellectual property. And third, we also are looking at our international markets and exploring ways to maximize our content globally to create greater value. We believe there's a lot of opportunity that remains in this area. Obviously, we're very early in the game when it comes to implementing our plans, but we're off to a good start and look to quicken the pace as we move past close. Now I'd like to turn it over to John Donovan for details on AT&T's communication second quarter results. John? Thanks, John. I'm really excited about Warner Media coming into our portfolio because it strengthens our ability to innovate across our businesses like content with content. I'm sorry, connectivity. So um, if we discuss if we, AT&T communications operating results, we'll start on slide 16. Our wireless business turned in an impressive quarter. John Stevens told you about the service revenue growth and strong margins. But we also had strong subscriber gains and continued our low postpaid phone churn. For the quarter, we added 46,000 postpaid phones. That makes nine consecutive quarters of year-over-year -year improvement. We had our best prepaid quarter in nine quarters with 453,000 prepaid net ads. This includes 356,000 phone net ads. We had a record connected device net ad quarter as well, adding 3 million new devices. Churn continues to run at near record low levels. Postpaid phone churn was 0.82%, just three basis points higher than last year's all time record. And we had record low prepaid churn thanks to our multi line plan penetration and auto bill pay. These customer gains and low churn are showing up in our service revenue where we turn positive both sequentially and year over year on a comparative basis. With the unlimited launch well behind us and targeted promotional activity, we saw service revenue improve each month in the quarter and we're on track to grow service revenue for the full year on a comparable basis. And we maintain comparable service margins above 50% again this quarter. Moving over to our entertainment group, we continue to see total video subscriber gains as we move through the transition of our video business. We had 80,000 total video net ads in the quarter with gains in DTV Now and Uverse more than offsetting losses in DirecTV. We also turned in solid broadband gains. Our entertainment group had 76,000 IP broadband net ads with 23,000 total broadband net ads. That's their seventh consecutive quarter of broadband growth. About 95% of our consumer broadband base is now on our IP broadband as our transition from DSL is drawing to a close. Our fiber build continues at a fast clip, now passing more than 9 million customer locations. And we expect at this time next year to reach 14 million locations. This gives us a long runway for broadband growth. We're doing very well in our fiber markets, including a 246,000 net increase in subs 
on our fiber network in the second quarter. Now I'd like to update you on several of the key initiatives we have underway, so we'll turn to slide 17. Evolving our video portfolio is the top priority for us. We believe we're well positioned as our customers move toward a more personalized set of streaming products. Our new platform was launched in May as the DirecTV Now user interface, and it's now live on all supported device operating systems and has been well received with strong engagement by customers. It offers a new cloud-based DVR and more robust video on demand experience with new pay-per-view options. Over time, it will bring additional advertising and data insight opportunities. This new video platform gives us flexibility to adapt to the market with new offerings and products. Late in the quarter, we added our third video offering called Watch TV, a small package of 30 live channels and 15,000 on-demand titles. We include Watch TV in our unlimited more wireless plans, or you can purchase it for $15 a month, making it perfect for customers who want video, but not at the cost of a large package. This complements DirecTV Now, where we continue to see success in attracting cord cutters and cord nevers. And later this year, we will begin testing a premium product extension which is a streaming product that will give the full direct TV experience over any broadband, ours or competitors. It will have additional benefits of an improved search and discovery feature and an enhanced user interface. We're excited that this will complement our top end product for those who don't want or can't have a satellite dish. Our open video platform also dovetails nicely with our ongoing focus on driving the industry's leading cost structure. The new platform is low touch with lower acquisition costs as streaming services become a bigger part of our business. Digital sales are a cost efficient way of customer engagement and we're seeing double digit growth in our digital sales and service. We're also seeing operating expense savings from our move to a virtualized software-defined network. More than 55% of our network functions were virtualized at the end of 2017, and we're well on our way to meet or exceed our goal of 75% virtualized by 2020. These and other cost management initiatives have helped drive 13 straight quarters of cost reductions in our technology and infrastructure group. Finally, I'd like to give an update on our first net build and other network investments. Our first net network build is accelerating. We expect to have between 12,000 and 15,000 band 14 sites on air by the end of this year, 2018, and we're ahead of our contractual commitment. And don't forget, when we're putting in equipment for first net, we're also deploying our AWS and WCS spectrum utilizing the one-touch, one-tower approach. This approach allows all customers access to our improved network. FirstNet also gives us an opportunity to sell to first responders. So far, more than 1,500 public safety agencies across 52 states and territories have joined FirstNet, nearly doubling the network's adoption since April. In addition to our efforts with FirstNet, 5G and 5G evolution work continues its development in several different areas that will pave the way to the next generation of higher speeds for our customers. We now have 5G evolution in more than 140 markets covering nearly 100 million people with theoretical peak speeds of at least 400 megabits per second with plans to cover 400 plus markets by the end of this year. Our millimeter wave mobile 5G trials are also going well, and we're on track to launch service in parts of 12 markets by the end of this year. With that, I now turn it over to Brian Lesser to discuss our advertising and analytics business. Brian. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everyone. As Randall mentioned, a critical component of the modern media company is a dynamic advertising business. One that can deliver on the promise of making advertising relevant, engaging, and actually matter to consumers, and make it work harder for advertisers and make it more valuable and optimized for publishers. 
I think about this simply. The course of the ad industry has been set by a series of defining moments. The rise of broadcast networks, the proliferation of cable networks and the pay TV bundle, digital advertising and its ability to target audiences. We sit here again today at yet another point that will define advertising for years to come. The pain points are obvious. Traditional advertising doesn't satisfy what both consumers and brands are looking for. Brands are frustrated with lack of access to data, lack of competence in targeting and measurement, and non-transparent ad tech costs. The industry talks about video convergence, but no tangible examples yet have emerged to deliver a unified buy-side and sell-side platform. So while the timing for disrupting the ad industry is right, you must have the assets to execute. And there is no doubt that AT&T is uniquely positioned to lead this disruption. In our view, successful ad marketplaces must have four key assets. Number one is premium content. Sports, news, original programming. We love our position with Turner content along with a scaled portfolio of ad inventory. Number two is distribution. Customers dictate how and where they consume content. Likewise, a relevant ad marketplace must be able to reach customers where they are, whether it's a 50-foot screen in a theater or a three-inch screen in your pocket. Number three is data. AT&T has access to expansive data sets on customer behavior and preferences. 170 million direct-to-consumer relationships across its wireless, video, and broadband businesses, 40 million set-top boxes, 20 million connected cars, and that's just for starters. But data needs to be activated to have value. We're building targeting and measurement capabilities that will bring greater value to consumers, advertisers, and publishers. And number four is technology. Content, distribution, and data must be integrated on a best-in-class ad technology platform. That's the rationale for our recent announcement to acquire AppNexus. This is a best-in-class, independent advertising marketplace supported by the best talent in the industry. We cannot wait to combine our teams and partner to make advertising matter to consumers. It is important to note we are not starting from a standstill. Both AT&T Advertising and Analytics and Turner have executed fabulously by using data and technology to fuel growth. AT&T Advertising and Analytics is consistently delivering double-digit revenue growth, including 16% growth in the second quarter. We will employ this same momentum and scale to deliver on our vision. So in closing, our plan is nothing short of leading the industry in creating a premium advertising marketplace across both TV and digital by quickly integrating AT&T assets, including AppNexus. It's this unique moment in time, coupled with this unique set of assets, that gives me confidence in our path forward. With that, I will hand it over to Lori Lee to talk about our Latin American operation. Thank you, Brian. The advertising opportunities that Brian laid out apply to Latin America as well. We have more than 30 million direct-to-consumer relationships, and we plan to run the same plays with the left hand business that we will be using in the United States. It won't happen overnight, but the opportunity is definitely there. Let me discuss our second quarter results. Those details are on slide 21. Starting with our Mexico wireless operations, we turned in another strong subscriber quarter with more than 750,000 net ads. That totals more than 3 million new customers in the past 12 months, doubling our subscriber base to 16.4 million since entering Mexico just three years ago. During that time, we've built a world-class LTE network and developed a marketing presence reflecting the AT&T brand. Our network build is in the final stages as we close in on covering 100 million people. We have rebranded 3,000 stores and have approximately 6,000 total retail locations, expanding our marketing presence and distribution. And we've upgraded and integrated our different billing systems. All this puts us in a great position to add customers and revenues at a lower cost. 
We're also making a lot of progress in improving our financials. Operationally, we're pushing on all fronts to exit the year EBITDA positive. In our Rio Pay TV business, currency devaluations have impacted our financial results, but the strength of our subscriber base and our profitability remain consistent. That continued to be true in the second quarter. The World Cup drove strong subscriber growth of 140,000, with particularly strong gains in prepaid. We finished the quarter with 13.7 million pay TV subscribers, a number that has held fairly steady since we acquired the business. The World Cup did drive higher expenses in the quarter, but we continue to drive profitability and positive free cash flow year to date. Now I'll turn it back to Mike for Q&A. Okay, thanks, Lori. Uh, Lori, Operator Lori, uh, we are ready to take questions. And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. You'll hear a tone indicating you've been placed into queue. You can remove yourself from the queue at any time by pressing the pound key. If you are using a speaker phone, please pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, press star then 1 at this time. And our first question from John Hudlick with UBS. Okay, thanks. And um, I think I'm going to bounce around a little bit, but maybe first for, for John Donovan, the um, you know, the wireless business, it looks like EBITDA was down about uh, .7%, I think, on a like-for-like -like basis. Um, but obviously, the return to growth in, in subscribers and some margin improvement. Um, should we be expecting that segment, you know, you still your biggest, to, to return to EBITDA growth, you know, as we look forward? Um, and then maybe one for Brian and then, and then for John Stanky. Brian, you know, you know, we've heard a lot about addressable advertising. Um, three percent growth this quarter on the advertising line. Um, you know, what are some of the milestones that, that we should expect, and, and maybe the timing on when this addressable advertising opportunity starts starts to take hold within these numbers? And then, lastly, um, John Stanky, the um, you obviously got some press recently um, in, in terms of an interview you did about uh, the new Warner Media. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the size of that 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 HBO spend? Um, I think they you know HBO spends about two billion. You're competing with companies. That spend you know eight billion a year you know m you know much bigger numbers. I mean, how should we think of that in terms of the uh, you know the overall financial profile of the company? And and maybe if you could elaborate on other D 2 C efforts you may have. I think you know we've heard about DC the, the DC universe and HBO now. But if if there's any other sort of initiatives we should be looking for. Thanks. Hey John, it's John Adam, and I'll start with the the question of wireless and, and EBITDA. We've had now um, three. Quarters in a row where our year-over-year -year comparison on subscriber growth was very good. Uh, we crossed over that all-important date where we got a lot of the reseller stuff behind us. We crossed over the date for the unlimited plans, um, and you've seen a lot of momentum in prepaid, which has really become a really nice business for us right now. Uh, we're in, in a really good rhythm there, firing on all cylinders. And so, uh, what we're seeing right now in this quarter, you know, John mentioned his opening remarks that we were stronger each month of the quarter within the quarter. Uh, we're starting to see us roll over some of those uh, earlier um, events, and, and now we're beginning to get strengthened. And so, because we, in the, the each month of this quarter, strengthened from subscriber counts, we also have had some, some pricing moves, calibration of pricing, if you will, um, that made us consistent with our value proposition in the marketplace. So we expect um, that we'll have growth for the year and the EBITDA uh, margins uh, to improve. John, I'll take the, the next part of your question. This is Brian Lesser. So you asked about milestones in the advertising business. I think it's important to know that you know, we have close to a $2 billion advertising business outside of what we just acquired in Turner, and that advertising business was growing 16% in the second quarter. So we're already showing the value of data and technology on, uh, on our advertising business. I think in terms of going forward, um, you should look for some things that we've already mentioned here in this call. Number one, our ability to increase the yield on the inventory that we have now within Turner uh, and Warner Media more broadly, and also increase value to the firm, but also value to publishers, advertisers, and to consumers. You'll see us continue to develop the ad platform at Nexus. Um, once we close that deal, is an important milestone for us, but you'll see us lean in and develop 
additional technologies around that platform. And then third is our ability to partner with other media companies outside of AT&T. In some ways, our success will depend on our ability to attract additional sources of inventory to reach um, critical mass for advertisers. So, John, let me just amplify the last piece that Brian gave. Data that we've had within the AT&T company applying to AdWorks has already been moved over into the Turner team to begin applying into existing inventory that we have using the same techniques that were piloted uh, in selling the two minutes of advertising that the AT&T team has across the broader inventory of Turner. So that's near term. That's not a milestone issue. That's today we're starting to look at those business cases and how we would do that. The teams have already come up with a variety of different initiatives around that, including, um, you know, we found out that, you know, Brian had a great opportunity to do addressable advertising in the pharmaceutical space, and some of the pharma pharmaceutical companies wanted 90-second avails, and he didn't have 90 seconds of inventory. So we're bridging Turner inventory with what used to be AT&T inventory so that we can have new addressable products to bring in. So that there's benefit to that data that's occurring now even without the broad mechanization and, and uh, intelligence and platform work that Brian brought to the table that he just discussed. So on direct-to-consumer, um, what I will tell you is what we know about this space is it requires scale, and you mentioned that there's a number of different initiatives underway within the Warner Media companies, and they're all, they're all good within their own right, they, but they all generate what I would consider to be relatively small-scale audiences, um, you know, a company our size, we want to be generating audiences in the tens of millions, not in the single digits of millions. And so the way I would think about our direct-to-consumer efforts over time is it's better together. There's a lot of very strong brands in the family that generate interest among groups of audiences. And on a standalone basis, they're not as powerful as they are when they're brought together. And you can assemble the genre of content and bring them together on one platform or one experience it aggregates and gets scale. And so over time, what you should think about how we're going to approach the discrete brands that we have is ultimately unify them in a more consistent and more focused experience that starts to bring some scale in. Uh, still very important properties. They still need to be developed. We've got to get the formula right for them, but over time we want the strength of them to come together. In terms of your reference to uh, the news cycles on HBO, it wasn't an interview. I think it was a, a internal discussion that was right. looked at. But um, uh, I would tell you I don't believe it effectively characterized what we are about. Uh, what we are about, as I said, is we have a tremendous amount of great projects already in the funnel that, as the HBO team and Richard would describe it, they have not been in a position to say yes to because of constraints on um, certain resources. What we're attempting to do is open up those constraints on very high top quality projects that we think will balance out the schedule so that we have a more engaging experience with HBO throughout the course of the year. That will improve the fact that we, we can see, especially on the digital platforms, we have customers jumping in and out based on scheduling. If we can smooth that schedule, we can drive churn down or improve retention and power additional subscriber growth. And so and I'm not going to give you the exact investment number, but the way I would think about it is we will make decisions to reinvest some of the efficiencies that we pick up from combining these companies together and running them in a little different fashion. We may give back a margin point or so in the near term as we grow the subscriber base as we reinvest in it. But it's going to be a very responsible investment in great projects that we've already scoped out, we already have rights for, we want to get into the development funnel, and the team feels very, very comfortable that we can flex up uh, on our development in a way that uh, we think rounds out the schedule very nicely. John, this is, uh, this is Randall. It, it, uh, well, this merger is different in terms that it's a vertical merger. 
there are certain aspects of the playbook that you just heard John describe that are going to be exactly the same. And that is generate synergies and then reinvest a significant portion of those synergies back into your capabilities and your product. Direct to consumer and deeper HBO content is just part and parcel to that. And that's no different than what we've done in the past and you should probably expect to see it happen here as well. Thanks, Thanks for guys. that question, John. Uh, Lori, we'll take the next question. And we go to Simon Flannery with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Um, for, for John Stevens, John, in, in the past you'd given um, some guidance with DirecTV on the medium term on, on EPS. Can you give us any color about the benefit of Time Warner or Warner Media in a full year 19? How should we be thinking about that given the up, upside to guidance this year? And then on the balance sheet, what are you assuming in terms of getting to 2.5 around additional divestitures and about things like spectrum acquisitions, or is that just run right with what you have right now? Thanks. Uh, a couple of things, Simon. Thanks for the questions. First of all, on, the, on getting to the uh, uh, 2.5 times by the end of next year, um, that's driven mainly by run rate with regard to cash flows, taking the cash flows above the dividend and paying down debt. Secondly, it, it is uh, important to achieve uh, the synergies, particularly the EBITDA boosting synergies and the growth that we're seeing and some of the growth that we're seeing in wireless and uh, customer additions so that we get a higher um, EBITDA number. Um, while we um, have normally plan for asset sales and constantly look at underutilized assets for monetization, for example, the data centers, the broadcast spectrum 600, which is a couple of billion dollars right there that we have under contract and waiting for approvals today. We'll continue to do that if you want to give a scope to it. Um, as of today, we have about a $500 billion in total assets. And so finding a few more opportunities to monetize assets seems to be very reasonable on top of the things that we've kind of commonly done with regard to uh, real estate and other underutilized business and spectrum. So that's that answer. I'm not giving you a specific number on asset sales, but as we've, as we've proven this year, we're going to continue to do that. And with regard to EPS guidance specifically around the acquisition, I'll say it this way. First and foremost, um, the point is, is that Warner Media, Time Warner, Warner Media, is immediately accretive. Revenues, free cash flow, EPS, um, we've seen it already, so that guidance that we've given, we'd expect we, we're standing by that and continue to expect that and, and have started to prove that out already. Um, secondly, we're not going to give a specific guidance with regard to uh, uh, Time Warner's impacts, but I'd suggest in this way, if you think about a $3.50 EPS range, for us that means $3.40 to $3.60. And we just said that we expect it to be the high end of that range. So that will give you an indication of um, using your own estimates, others' estimates, uh, where we were, what we expect it to be for the rest of the year. I will, um, I will point out that the two cents we've got in the uh, second quarter for two weeks was, um, as I said, uneven, and specifically it's because the NBA contract for playoffs all that content was expended before we merged. Uh, the Golden State Warriors won the championship on June 8th, so that content expense was recognized uh, before we went through the deal, so we have some higher uh, profitability in, in those 16 days than you might otherwise expect. But I'd expect profitability to continue no matter what. We'll give specific EPS guidance um, for 19 um, in, in the coming months, I would just suggest um, that we continue to expect this transaction to be a creative revenue, free cash flow, and EPS. Thanks, Thank Simon. you. Sorry, you ready for the next question? We go to Phil Cusick, J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Um, seems like we're going around on the same questions, but one for Brian. Can you talk about really what has to be done here to realize the addressable ad vision? And what's the timing of this coming through to accelerate the numbers and, and start to be really material on the company? Can this impact 2019, or are we really talking about 2020? And how do you see the potential to reduce the ad load while you raise CPMs? Thanks. 
In terms of, thanks for the question, Phil. Um, in terms of timing, um, as John Spanky outlined, there are some things that we can do immediately to start to add value to Turner ad inventory, and um, that's already in motion. And so, you know, we, we think there's short-term value there in 2018. I would say in terms of the overall addressable opportunity, um, that's a little bit further out. We have work to do in terms of building the technology platform, but the good news there is because of the amount of inventory that exists within DirecTV, also within Warner Media, we can prove out the value of AT&T data and the investments that we're making in technology, plus the evolution of our direct-to-consumer relationship that John Donovan talked about. So I think what you'll see from us is to uh, really start to extract value from inside of AT&T using our inventory um, across DirecTV and Warner Media in 2018. And then in 2019, we're going to start to partner very effectively across other sources of inventory uh, to bring value. Phil, John, seems if I could add to that. I mean, I want to point out Brian's humble here in the sense that he started getting 16% revenue growth on those ads in the DirecTV universe uh, footprint uh, possibility. Uh, those ads watched by the same people as the ones watched the Turner ads. So we've got proof that this works. Secondly, when the Ad Nexus deal closes, we'll have the ability to take our internal activity and put it on that supply side platform that will be within our control. Um, so we are optimistic about the opportunities to get value out of the Ad Nexus platform. Uh, we've got the OJ approval for it. We're waiting to get some other country approvals. I hope to close it before the next time we speak, certainly. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm optimistic about that, too. So Brian's got a lot of things going and heading in the right direction. Okay, and in terms of the – and in terms of the ad load, thank you. In terms of the, the ad load, so our objective, Phil, is not just to improve advertising as it exists today, but to also improve the experience for consumers. We're in a unique position to do that because of our vertical integration. Because we have content and we have that direct-to-consumer relationship over a traditional television, over a mobile phone, over other mobile devices, um, we can start to do things in terms of innovating the ad experience. As an example, um, you'll see us start to introduce products across the rest of this year and, and obviously into next year where the consumer watching television has a better experience that is less interrupted. Uh, interruptive. Imagine a, a direct TV customer watching the big screen on their living room wall, and instead of seeing a traditional ad break, they see an icon on a car in a movie that they're interested in or in a show that they're interested in. And then we have the ability to create a seamless ad experience on their mobile device, which is on the coffee table or in their pocket, pause real-time content to interact with a better ad experience um, and therefore deliver more relevant content to our customer and to the consumer more broadly. That has the ability, number one, to be a better experience for our customers and consumers, a better business for us because those ad units will generate a higher CPM and a higher yield and a better experience for advertisers and the media company representing the, the content. So that's really our objective, is to start to innovate because of our access to data technology and the direct-to-customer relationship. I would, Phil, I would just comment that this notion of more innovative ad formats is critical. It's not just lighter ad load. While that's important and we'd like to achieve it, I think what we all understand is that viewing habits are moving away in many instances from the linear feed. And so my goal working with distributors such as my partner here at the table who is a large distributor of my product is to also start to take these better software-driven platforms that they have and lay out more on-demand content for them that allows for what used to be linear content to be available and stacked and other formats, and then attach to that the right kind of advertising that isn't loading that on-demand content with the same commercial loads, but is also highly targeted and customized to the particular experience that the individual is going through. 
and we saw how mobilizing and moving to TV everywhere raised consumption of the traditional linear fare. I think we have another opportunity to take a fairly mature pay TV product and extend the runway even further by being more aggressive in trying to incent the distributors to carry more depth in the library. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Operator will take the next question, please. We go to John Janitas with Jeffries. Um, thank you. Um, one for John Stanky. Maybe a follow-up on HBO. Um, as you know, domestic subs have been in the 30 million to maybe 35 or so million range over the past few years. Um, and you've talked about the content investment, but will there be a more aggressive direct-to-consumer push that perhaps would include maybe a Turner bundle um, or maybe a change to more wholesale deals with existing distributors? And is there any consideration to reset the price, which has largely remained steady as many of your peers have been more promotional? Uh, thank you. So uh, I would tell you that our wholesale distributors remain a really important part of our product, and we want to make the product better to improve its performance for their businesses as well as the HBO brand overall. And as I indicated, we'd like to, for example, improve our term characteristics by getting a more complete annual schedule that has people uh, fully incented to stay in the product and not jump in and out of it as uh, various content comes and goes through the course of the year, and we think we've got some good steps that we can take in that regard that will help our sub counts and continue to grow through our traditional distribution channel. Um, I do believe that as we invest in the platform itself, the direct-to-consumer platform, and improve some of the technical capabilities associated with it, that uh, our features that can be brought to bear in a typical uh, OTT SBOT environment, that we can also increase the distribution of the digital versions of the product that, that go direct on retail. And so we want to run that play as well. Uh, I will tell you that I don't think that's a what I would call right now a step function change over the next couple of months, but we can incrementally get better on our current run rates by having some success in that regard. Um, in terms of what other content can be paired with HBO and maybe a more broad offer, I, I think we have a number of distributors out there um, that have some great ideas around how they might want to match HBO to their particular content offerings. And as I said, I want to look at the depth of our Warner Media offerings that we have and get better together and understand how we can bring some of our Warner Media brands and our other uh, uh, curated options into a more focused direct-to-consumer strategy that I think as we start to get uh, our strategy together on that, move forward on it, you could see that step function increase in more retail-oriented customers. Thanks for anything on price, John. Okay, thanks, thanks, John. Thanks, John. Take the next question, operator. And we go to Brett Feldman with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. You know, one of the stronger trends we saw in this quarter was a nice improvement in postpaid phone ARPU. And actually, some of your peers, we've seen something similar so far this quarter. Also, if we look at the market and we look at some of the pricing moves you've made and others have made, there's an introduction of higher price points. It's not really price increases, but it's really just if you pay more, you'll get more. So I was hoping maybe you could just expand in terms of what your customers are asking for, uh, why you've identified a, a cohort that has shown a willingness to pay more for more, and, and how durable you think this, this trend might be. Yeah. Brad, you've been obviously watching our commercials. That, that, uh, that whole idea is and more. And so what we're trying to do is um, differentiate the product in ways that don't have to do with uh, speeds, uh, megabytes, or rack rate pricing. And so what we're really focused on is product engagement. The value of, of any customer will be the based on the combination of the price and the value that they use for it. And that's why I would say from a consumer perspective, our strength in consumer has been heavily in the bundling of video with wireless. So we see increased engagement. We're, we're finding that people find a lot of value for it. And then we're kind of spreading the offers to fit budgets and, and engagement. And so um, you've seen that in wireless, and I would point out to you that that pattern may look familiar in video, that we're trying to find various price points, engagements, and content combinations that fit everybody's budget so that everybody views that they're getting value and, and they do that 
not just by focused on megabytes and, and pricing. So um, I think that it's, um, it's not a, an accidental trend that we stumbled onto. It was actually a strategy that centered on, you know, in the direct TV merger that we were pushing in and that fits very well with this next step with Warner Media and our sister over there uh, provides us a lot of flexibility. So I do think it's a trend. I do think that uh, if we succeed, when we succeed, others will be will uh, follow and make some of the moves in their own. And I think that uh, the, right now we see the most important thing, which was in engagement and customer delight for the product improving. And that, that to us translates to value, and we're going to price the value. And so I think the industry uh, will continue, hopefully, to take uh, to, 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 to look at that and, and it'll be rational as a result of that. So we're going to continue down this path, more of it uh, rather than less of it and expect it to be successful. A quick follow-up, if you don't mind. Obviously, the plans that include a lot of content tend to be at the higher prices, and you clearly see that helps ARPU. Are you seeing that they are also helping churn? Yeah, if you look at, at, at the churn, uh, this year was you know, three bips up over, but, but I think that compared to the industry, we did really well. Compared to seasonality, we did really well. And the number that we're comparing to last year was our all-time low. So um, I, I do think that it's, it's a strategy that's working for consumers and therefore working for us. And that is, you know, the currency that we're after there because you can start to trade um, some things that customers value um, higher than the ARPU differential. So we are carefully managing this portfolio same strategy on wireless and, and in video. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Sure. Okay, thanks, Brad. Lori, we'll go with the next question, please. We go to David Barden with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the question, and thanks for the uh, expansive format on the call. I think it's super helpful. Um, Randall, I guess my first question would be, you know, as a telco guy, the media industry is definitely not in my wheelhouse uh, yet. But, um, you know, if I'm watching what's happening out there, we've got, Fox deciding that they're not big enough to be a competitor uh, in the media industry, so they're selling. And we've got two you know, large competitors in, in Comcast and Disney who feel in order to be competitive with the Netflixes and the Googles of the world, they need to get even bigger. And, and so I guess my question for you is, is kind of how, do you, how comfortable do you feel with the scale that you have now in the content business? And, and, and are, you know, are you on the cusp of having a global strategy that, that, that's going to kind of try to compete with those those other larger content houses. Uh, that would be my first one if I could. And then the second one, John, would be for you. Um, we've been hearing a lot about the directionality of the deal, about how we take the information from your side of the business. We bring it over to Brian and let him crunch through it and sell it into Turner. But, you know, as you sit there and look at what Warner Media could mean to your business, the broadband business, the mobile business, um, uh, even the, um, uh, the business business, kind of what do you see as the opportunities um, and if you could give us some examples, it would be super helpful. Thanks. Okay. Hi, David. This is Randall. Uh, I'll go first, and I'll, I'll hand it over to John Donovan. You said John. That's just not very descriptive. Oh, here. We sorry. Got to <laughs> you, David. <laughs> uh, but I'll direct that to John Donovan when I finish. But in, in terms of you know, the, what you're seeing happen in the, the landscape, the media landscape, it's, it's fascinating to us. We – we expected some time back this is exactly what you would see happen, that you'd begin to see media companies uh, consolidate and, and people would see the importance of, of scale and changing models, changing distribution models and so forth. And uh, so it, it's hard to imagine, but it was back in 2016 when we actually did this deal. And so it was early in 2016 when we were asking ourselves, if you believe that's going to happen, if you believe that your networks are going to be able to distribute seamlessly uh, premium content, if you believe that your information in your distribution business is really valuable and can drive different advertising models, then you probably ought to move fast and own media. And as we looked at a scan of, of what opportunities were out there, it Time Warner jumped out uh, as just uh, the obvious choice. It was the one scale player that had a great scale distribution platform. It had great scale in terms of advertising inventory and cable networks. It had the scale position in terms of content creation with Warner Brothers, and it was just the obvious partner for us. And everything else was a distant second. And so. 
from the, the to answer your question directly, we feel really good about what we have. And then you add to it the digital properties and CNN being an off the charts great digital property. You put all the CNN digital properties together, they are the most uh, access digital news sites in the world. And so putting all this capability, data, ad tech, and so forth together with this media company, we think is a really, really great combination, and we could not be happier that we moved first. Uh, I think uh, moving first, you, you rarely forget, you rarely regret it uh, when you see an industry trend happen. So we saw this one happen, we went first, and, and we think we got the best business that was on the that was actually in the media space. So we feel really good about it. JD, you want to talk about integration of content? Sure, thanks. Uh, so Dave, we had 600 days to think about this. Um, and uh, you know, when you, when you form your synergies, you deal with the straightforward things that, uh, that John Stanky talked about. But we, over the last uh, year or so, as we started to, to put wireless and video together, um, and saw the trend I talked about earlier start to manifest. We, we are learning it as an integrated carrier. So I, I circle back and say, when we bought DirecTV, remember we were talking about bundling up and a lot of skepticism about the value of bundling up versus it being just a price discount. And I gotta tell you, you start to look at the economics of churn reduction and you start to learn how these currencies pass back and forth, you see the same opportunities here. You see because the killer app right now on uh, broadband and on wireless is video. So as you start to look at what customers place value on and you move from, you know, buying and reselling or worse yet being completely out of that market and you go to owner's economics, we really have always had a good sense of what customers are using and doing on our network. So to be able to value that into pricing and start to trade off these currencies that we learned over the last three years of how do you trade off an acquisition dollar for a dollar of content? How do you trade off um, a customer install cost versus a churn reduction? We've built some solid muscle now to know how those economics move around. So we are really thrilled about what the content business can mean for us in simple ways. Uh, store traffic, our, our, uh, one of our wireless strengths is that our close rates in stores are up. We want more traffic in the store. If we have a tent pole release uh, from the uh, studio, and we can find a way to integrate in the stores and drive traffic, we found a synergy. So, so basic things that video does, like drive traffic and hours of consumption, become assets for us to acquire uh, value in ARPU and retain customers, and we really are, are getting our strides to figure out how to move those currencies across franchises. So we're really thrilled about what this can do for broadband and for, for mobility. David, let me just suggest I want to flip your first question around slightly. I, I don't worry about scale and content. I mentioned at the outset of this discussion that we're going to do 70 TV shows for the industry this year out of Warner Brothers. Didn't even talk about what the incremental number of series will be coming out of HBO, which is very unique, high value, premium content that's targeted. Our ability as a company to decide to produce content that's scaled, that matters, is probably second to none in the industry. And that's at a rate that I'm not sure others you know, operate at or are just coming close to that. I think the race is on for scaling customer bases, not scale on on media content. We're in a good shape on our ability to scale media content. We have, and we start with 170 million customer relationships in that race to have a scaled customer base to sell to. So I, I don't worry about that dynamic. You know, and that's the Stanky's comment, uh, the 170 million. Add to it what John has over in, in Warner Media when we talk about CNN.com being the most uh, uh, frequented uh, news site in the world. You put CNN.com, the Otter Media, uh, Bleacher Report together. There's another, I believe it's 106, almost 200 million monthly users, unique monthly users on each of those sites, and so. 
this is already a big scale direct to consumer business. And so now, what can you do with HBO and some of the, uh, the Warner content uh, in, in terms of taking it directly to the consumer as well? Then add the owner's economics that John Donovan just spoke of, and then the ability to have owner's economics going across these platforms. Pretty exciting. That's great. Thank you for helping. Question. Thank you. Can we go to Mike McCormick, Guggenheim Securities? Hey guys, thanks. Uh, John Donovan, uh, just uh, maybe some questions regarding entertainment margins, some puts and takes uh, as we think about the second half. Obviously, you've got some NFL costs that are going to uptick, um, but what, what should we be thinking about as sustainability in that sort of 24% type range? And then secondly, I guess uh, a question, I guess just for actually maybe John Donovan and John Stanky, just thinking about the Watch TV product, uh, I guess firstly, any sort of early takeaways from that product, how successful it is. And then also, can you use that as a model for more um, integration with the, with the Time Warner or Warner Media assets? Uh, and how far can you take that without risking legacy linear distribution revenue? Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. A lot of questions nested in there. I'll try to uh, be brief and have you ask follow-ups if I miss anything. Um, if you start with video margins, um, you, you see this the beginning of the evolution of our products that we're trying to get them, as I mentioned earlier, into affordability slots where you get high engagement and therefore high value for the money. One of the things that is, is not well published as you think about these, they have stream count differentials, so they fit into different viewing patterns. So watch TV as a single stream product, uh, the uh, direct TV now having two with a pay up to three, you know, obviously the linear TV products, um, the, the satellite delivered and what we are going to be coming out with here in beta uh, next quarter in the early stages, which is a, a broadband delivered version of it. Now all of a sudden you have a, a whole series of, of price points. And so um, you saw the beginning of what we're doing to reshape DirecTV Now. DirecTV Now is a placeholder in the market until the deal was finished. That placeholder in the market, that product tried to do too much and too little. So we tried to stretch it down on price. We tried to stretch it up in value. But over time, we think that there will need to be, hit various price points and get the right uh, package bundled in there so, so customers find value for it. So you saw the first move is that we added uh, vertical capabilities on top of it, a third stream. Um, and with, when we got cloud DVR and enhanced the product, we, we put the price into the market rate for that price. So we've seen DirecTV Now, we just had a very strong quarter of DirecTV Now ads. So I highlight for you that when you net all of this uh, drama out for a minute on sub counts, so we start there, um, we were 25 million subscribers when we bought DirecTV, we're at 25 million subscribers now. With customers we lost in cord nevers and cord cutters, we've replaced with products that fit their affordability range. We watch cannibalization closely, roughly 15 to 17 percent on every given in any given month is the cannibalization rate. But one third of those are listed in our linear TV product is very likely to churn because their engagement and or the cost don't fit. So, so we are watching that very closely. We're slotting these products into affordability and engagement range where we get the value of it. And I'll point out to you how we procure content on Watch TV. There's a variable nature to its cost. It is profitable and reasonably comparable to the traditional margins of the business on a percentage of revenue basis. And so the real question that we're learning as we go, once we get out of linear TV and get into open video, which is software-based TV, how much does the category grow? Because we're getting cord nevers, cord cutters, but also we're getting redundant accounts where it's becoming a personal video product where a team with a more personalized approach can build a playlist and stack their favorites in a way that it becomes a one stream product that is a playlist that behaves much like music. So when you start to look at addressable, mar uh, addressable markets, you look at the ARPU available, the margins, and then you add the owner's economics, which is Brian Lesser getting higher CPMs and, and John Stanky having owner's economics on a portion of that video cost, now these margins start to blend up into much higher territory. So we look very closely at the blended margin 
and the movement between these rungs, all while keeping an eye to make sure our subscriber counts keep us at that 25 to 30 percent uh, share player in the marketplace. And so that's how we're thinking about the strategies and the margins. And the last thing I'll point out is that on those lower end products, on a revenue basis, I'll remind you that the acquisition cost is much lower because it's much more heavily a digitally um, acquired product. And also the SAC costs are lower. The cost to deploy and the cost to maintain is much lower. So over time, as we build those volumes up, those are products that will get scalable margins. Uh, I'll stop there and see if I missed anything. Uh, this is John Stevens, JD. Great job on that. I, I'll, I'll give it to you this way. First of all, Mike, we're not giving out specific guidance on, on, on margins on any of the specific businesses. I, as I mentioned before, when I think Simon asked the question with regard to uh, Time Warner specific EPS impacts, well, um, what I will tell you is, is this. What JD talked about, the fact that we'll be able to move uh, uh, DTV Now's deliverables, cloud DVR, streams, pay-per-view, you know, future data insights and other opportunities is going to provide revenue opportunities. Secondly, the fact that you've got the four products that are going to cut down on the subscriber acquisition costs, moving from a satellite, a truck, you know, the only truck that shows up now is not one of our trucks that hang a dish, but maybe the UPS or the FedEx truck delivering the thin client in the future. All of those things give us the uh, expectations that we can see the margins continue to improve. As, as our advertising team continues to learn more um, and get more effective, those advertising revenues will help out on that entertainment uh, margins. So all of those things are, are giving us uh, optimism as we go forward. With that being said, uh, we've got, you know, traditionally had tough compares with the NFL content and so forth the rest of the year, so we're not giving specific uh, guidance on margins for the third and fourth quarter. Well aware of the uh, improvement and, the, you know, some of the stabilization of the operating contributions of the entertainment group uh, uh, were, uh, you know, we noticed that, we're aware of it, the team's working hard to achieve that, but we'll keep this process going to um, see overall improvement on a year-over-year -year basis um, in the, you know, coming in, in 2019, and that's when we'd expect to see it. Okay, thank, thanks, Mike. Uh, Lori, we'll, we'll take one more question. Thank you. That's from Mike Rollins with City. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. Uh, two, if I could, how do you view your sports rights between Sunday Ticket for DTV and the NBA for Turner as sustainable points of differentiation for your media strategy? And how important is it to take those content rights and put them into your emerging, evolving, direct-to-consumer strategy and platforms? Well, let me uh, all answer on behalf of the Turner side of things in sports, and John can certainly address the NFL relationship on uh, DirecTV. The, uh, I, I, look, I view the right sports rights as being critical to our strategy over time, and I view the right sports rights with leagues that want to participate in a manner that is uh, reflective of how platforms are evolving and how technology is evolving and how consumers are changing their consumption patterns as being the right partners to work with. And I feel pretty good about the partners that we have at Turner and their flexibility to sit down and look at new models, new approaches to how they put their content in front of consumers, how they think about the importance of digital in their product, and the speed at which they're willing to move around those things. Um, our advertising business is a healthier business with sports in the mix. I think you saw that in the second quarter numbers. Those were largely powered by the great performance of the NBA and a, a, a wonderful product that they have, and they're great partners. And so um, I think it will be very important for us to continue to manage that portfolio and have the right mix of sports and general entertainment in our portfolio that's attractive to customers in the linear format. And we'll continue to do that going forward. Now, that mix may change a little bit. Um, you know, over time, different options may show up. But the asset test is going to be, I think, sports that um, are well received by customers, that are valued properly, that are flexible in how they work with distribution rights and technology, and that work in today's fast-paced and dynamic society uh, in terms of how they're consumed. 
I don't, I don't know. This is Randall, Mike, and I, I don't know if there's much to add as it relates to the NFL. I think John Stanky just characterized what it is that we look for in terms of what's important when you think about sports programming. And uh, it's really critical when you think about our business, where everything is going, where John Stanky is going direct to consumer, where John Donovan is building platforms that are streaming platforms, where Brian Lesser's monetization opportunities for advertising are tied to streaming capabilities. Those will probably be our best opportunities. So finding sports programming that fits within those directions where we as a company are going are really, really important. And I would also say just as we get more targeted, just sort of a um, one way to think about it is a sports lover in the future is not going to be the segmentation. It's going to be uh, a Red Sox fan, a Yankee fan who you know, spends winters in Tampa. So these things have been acquisition tools over time. They're much more retention and engagement tools now that fit in that profile I mentioned earlier. And so we're going to really be trying to innovate on, on all of these things that are very segment specific. And I think you're going to see us really get creative in what we do going forward. Okay, very good. Listen, that, that wraps up what we wanted to cover uh, with you this evening. I appreciate everybody joining us. What I would sum it up by saying is we, we've had a, a few months of distraction. And make no mistake about it, it's been a bit of a distraction for both businesses, the Warner Media as well as the AT&T side. That is behind us, and we are executing. And I feel like we're executing very well on the communications business side the momentum is gaining. As you're seeing, service revenues are up. Subscriber metrics are improving. Margins are improving. Improving. I feel really good about how that team is executing. The Warner Media side, I, I couldn't be happier with the position that the company is in, the business is in, and uh, it's going quite well. Our LATAM business, Mexico, it's going on all cylinders. Uh, it, it's uh, been aggressive on pricing down there but we are staying the course, we're competing aggressively, and we're gaining a lot of momentum and have a, a strong path and a good uh, line of sight to profitability. And stay tuned on advertising. I could not be more excited about the opportunity here for advertising and the ad tech acquisitions we've made. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, look forward to seeing and talking to everybody again.